11th chapter of the book of Mark. Hallelujah. Mark's gospel. Hallelujah. Let's begin reading. Um, oh, we'll just start. In, we'll start at the beginning of the chapter. How about that? And when they were come nigh to Jerusalem and to Bethany, and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent forth to his disciples and said, "Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as you enter in, you shall find the colt tied wherein never man sat. Loose him and bring him to me. And if any man say unto you, Why do you this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will." Send him hither. And they went their way, found the colt tied by the door without in the place where the two ways met, and they loose him. And certain of them that stood there said unto him, Why, why do ye loosen the colt? And they said unto him, that Even as Jesus had commanded, and they let him go. And they brought the colt to Jesus, and gathered the garments on him, cast their garments on him, and said, Cast their garments on him, and he sat upon him. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off the trees and strawed them in the way. And when they went before, they and that they followed, cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered into the temple of Jerusalem and, took, and, and, and into the temple. And when he looked round about upon all things, and now as eventide was come, he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. And on the morrow when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came of happily. He might find anything thereon, and when he came, he found it. He came to it. He found nothing but leaves, for the time of the figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, "Now the reason for that is the fig trees were supposed to have figs when they had leaves. I mean, Jesus wasn't, you know, dumb. He just didn't go over there. Oh, but maybe he'll find some figs. No, it had leaves. It was it was out of season. You ever you ever see something get out of season? You know, blo blossom out. We just went up uh, recently. We were somewhere in the. Um, the azaleas were blooming at the Biltmore last week or two weeks ago, a week and a half ago. It was not, not all of them, just one little patch was, but it was blooming, and they're supposed to have bloomed a long time ago. Um, but it's been a weird year, so they were, they were out of season. So, but, you know, you can't, you can't run around everywhere and start looking for azaleas because they're not. It's just that one, particular, for whatever reason, they, that one got a, got, a, got a wild hair and bloomed. <laughs> okay? Well, we had a fig tree here that got a wild hair and, and got leaves. We're supposed to have some figs. And so, and Jesus answered. See, it said, I got figs. Now, I'm, I'm mighty hot out in the house now. Mine is mighty hot right now. Okay? Yeah, the mic is hot. All right. I know it's hard. To, it's, you never know. One minute it's not right, next minute it is right. It's just, um, hallelujah. It's an ongoing thing with sound systems. It's always that way. All right. And Jesus answered. In other words, he responded to the response to the declaration of the fig tree that says, I got figs. And it didn't. He said, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. That pretty much ends its fruit-bearing days. And his disciples did what? They what? Heard it. So this was not a silent declaration. No such thing. Nor is there such thing as silent prayer. Now you might be meditating, but even the word meditate really means to mutter. Hello? You know, you'll meditate in the book of law day and night. The word there means to mutter. You don't silently mutter. You say, I mean, you might be under your breath, kind of, but you're still muttering. You're saying something. Uh, just understand that Christianity is, is uh, heavily weighted upon what you say. Amen? And not what you think. All right? You got to say stuff. Now, what you think on will govern what you end up saying. So they're not saying that think, thinking doesn't have anything to do with it, but a lot of people think they're, they're communicating stuff and they're, they're acting in faith when they're never saying stuff. You've got to say it. And they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple, began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seat of them that sold doves, and were not allowed that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught them, saying, is, is it not written, my house should be called a house of nations, uh, of all nations, the house of prayer? But you've made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and the chief priests heard it and saw how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his doctrine. 
And when the the evening had come, he went out of the city. And in the morning, as they passed by, now, uh, literally, the Greek here, the phrase, this particular phrase, uh, and in the morning, could mean uh, uh, after a period of time. It doesn't necessarily mean the next day. Okay? Now, that's important. Actually, that, it, it really, if you study that out a little bit, you'll find that, that carries more the import of a, a period of time had passed more than they got up the next morning and went right back into town. Okay? So there's a period of time here that had passed. And so in the morning or after a period of time, and that's important because a lot of people think, boy, bang, when Jesus spoke, it happened the next morning. Well, really? According to this, if you, in, in the Greek, you can study this and kind of come up with the, the idea that uh, some time had passed. They went by that fig tree more, maybe more, more than once. How many of you have ever dec- made a declaration of faith and walked by your faith project several times and it still looks the same way it did when you made your faith dec- declaration? Okay? But see, faith is not moved. Faith is not moved by, the, by you know, uh, I said it and it didn't happen instantly. And let, let's face it, folks. I mean, hungry jack instant potatoes are okay in a rush, but they're not the same as make, cutting them, peeling the potatoes, boiling them, mashing them up, and having them fresh. It's not the same. Amen. So everybody kind of wants, wants something real quick. But just you know, just let your faith work. Amen. Actually, Peter says, uh, th- "Let your patience have perfect work, that you may be perfect, in, uh, perfect and entire, wanting nothing." When patience has had a perfect work, that you be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Possess your faith. Possess, your, possess your, 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 belief, your, your soul with patience, and your faith will have time to work. All right. So in the morning or after a period of time, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter calling to remember it, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. Now, I curse weeds in my yard. I do it with Roundup. Now, you can go out there and spray Roundup on it, and, and, and right about there the next morning, it's still sitting there, that green. Hello? But give it a few days. Now, I had I, my, my uh, front flower things in my driveway got out of hand this summer. It just got busy. In this, in the, and I had already done stuff earlier in the summer, but they got out of hand. I mean, it's like them weeds just love to grow there. And I had all kinds of stuff. And I went out there and cut the top of a weed or got it down short, and then I soaked it with professional Roundup. I had one Thinking weed like this, it was stalked that big. I cut it off and then poured it right down in the stalk. <laughs> Next morning, it was all sitting there nice and green. Hello? I said, hello. Next, the day after that, it just uh, not quite as green. If you're right by my house right now, I hadn't had time to go take it all out. But it's dead, dried up, laying down on the ground. Brown. Looks like you hung it in a tobacco barn and cured it. You know, it's dried up from the roots. Because what Roundup does, it goes down into the root system and blocks the root system, providing any nutrients to the plant, and it dries up. That's how it works. I don't know if you knew that or not, but it goes down, it goes down to the root system, and it blocks all the root system's ability to, to pull water and nutrients into the plant. And it kills it from the roots up. Jesus, Jesus' word was like Roundup on that fig tree. Hello. It was dried up from the roots. Amen. And Jesus answered and said, Because I am the Son of God, because I have great and mighty faith, because I was sent from the Father above, my words have authority and power. Is that what he said? It's not what he said. Jesus said to them, Now listen, they just made an observation that the fig tree he cursed, remember they heard it, so they knew he cursed it. He said, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter. How long? Forever. They heard him say it. Now they come by at, uh, either, either, if you just want to stay with, with the King James, the next morning or after a period of time, as I believe the Greek b- b- bears out more accurately. Okay, after a period of time, uh, they come by. He looks over and goes, hey, man, that fig tree's dead. Hey, Jesus! Whoa! Lord! You know, that fig tree you cursed is dried up from the roots. And Jesus doesn't even acknowledge the fig tree. He just says, have faith in God. Or have the God kind. Well, it's an object lesson now. Have the God kind of faith or the faith of God. 
Okay? For verily I say unto you, the word verily in Elizabethan English, but uh, it's used to convey the, the, the word meaning uh, really a solemn oath or I swear to you. So verily, I mean, this is a strong term. It's, you know, we, we kind of look at it and go, verily, verily, what does that mean? I mean, it's, it's, like a, it's a solemn oath. Jesus says, I give you a solemn oath, I swear to you. Well, the Bible says not to swear by heaven or that. I get it. You know, he's not swearing. He's, he's making a, a solemn declaration. He's making a verse. He, he, by using the term verily, what you, the Greek word that King James uses verily for, he's making a very strong statement here. He says, so verily, or I make a solemn oath to you that whosoever. Now, Jesus just said whosoever. So how many whosoever are there? Then he says that whosoever have to do something. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that the things he saith shall come to pass, and shall have whatsoever he saith. Now, notice here that there's a lot of qualifiers around believing in your heart. He didn't say whosoever believes in your heart or have what he believed, did he? Then you go to verse 25, or 24, he goes on and says, Therefore I say unto you what things soever you desire when you pray or ask. We've talked about it numerous times about the Greek word of T.O. Um, whatever, whatever things you desire when you ask or pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Now listen, so we got, we got this heart-believing thing going on here. But in order for that heart-believing thing to work, there's something else that goes on with it. Now in both verses, verse 23 and 24, the action that is required to get faith into motion is to say something. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that the things which he saith shall come to pass, he'll have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray or ask, um, believe that you receive them, and ye shall have them. Now, in other words, what things you desire, you have a desire. Amen. Believe that you receive them when ye ask for it you got it. see asking denotes speaking we said this numerous times you can't drive at the mcdonald's and give an unspoken order try it don't even forget mcdonald's burger king's right across the street here leave here tonight drive there get their drive throw and they say can i help you i have an unspoken order and see what you get they're probably going to say, sir or ma'am, I can't help you with that. Well, why not? Because I have to know what you want in order to fulfill the order. In other words, if you want to order something, you're going to have to say it. Or let's put, communicate it. Well, somebody's deaf and dumb, they can't talk. Well, they've got to communicate it. You know, if there's no sign language, there's their form of speaking is it's with sign language. I mean, if, in certain cases, they'd have to write things down. You know, but there's, there has to be that, that communication and the primary mo form of communication, except in cases where someone is, is suffering from an impediment, an impediment, is to speak it. So the believer, you know, something funny, people who get filled with the Holy Ghost, even if they're deaf and dumb, speak in tongues. Hallelujah. Yep. Because it's of the spirit, not of the head. That's right, glory. They speak in tongues. Even if they're deaf and dumb, they still speak in tongues. Because it's coming out of the spirit. It's not coming from a cognitive place. That's just food for thought. Hallelujah. All right. So, Jesus, we're, now we're not going to deal with, you know, we know, you know verse 25 and 26, when you stand praying, if you got ought, if you have ought against any. <laughs> if you have ought against any. If you have ought against any. Amen. And this goes along with your faith work. If you got something against somebody, get straight because your faith won't work. Say glory. Yeah, glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. No, all right. So here we have Jesus. And, and we're just, let's talk about this a little bit tonight. I mean, it's not, you know, it's, this isn't something we ever, have never talked about. But it's always good to be reminded that if you're going to get your faith to work, you're going to have to be talking things. Yeah. Now, we're always talking stuff. The majority of the time, we're talking unbelief I mean, as a society. I mean, if the doctor comes in and gives you a report, what does everybody do? Everybody starts mimicking the report. Isn't that right? 
The doctor said they got six months. Boy, and they said, hey, they got six months. That's all that. You know, before, by that time it's down the road, he don't have but a few days. You know? What is that? That's a doctor's report. And everybody, people start re rehearsing that and rehashing that. What are they doing? They've accepted that as truth, and they begin to speak what they believe. Well, because the doctor said it. Doctors know everything, don't they? No. Do you know what, do you know what they call what they do? Practicing medicine. They're still practicing. They've been, they've been in, you know, uh, grad school or, or, or postgraduate, post-high school for 12 years to become a doctor. And when they go out there, they say they're practicing medicine. Hello? Are you here? Now, see, football players practice all week and then play the game on Sunday. But the only, doctors only when they're going into a surgery and they're practicing medicine. Now, listen, I'm not against doctors, but let's understand, they don't know everything. Just because they say it don't make it so. And as a matter of fact, I don't think you're... Uh, you're Look at Isaiah 53, 1. It's a very interesting statement here. It says, Who hath believed our report? Hello? Who hath believed our report? And for whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Now, let's stop here for a second. We got that song we sing, that kinda, it kind of came out of this verse. Whose report will you believe? We will believe the report of the Lord. Because huh. there's always going to be a report coming from somewhere. There's always going to be a declaration coming from somewhere. And you've got to learn that every report you hear is not accurate. Uh, boys, so you, you listen. Now, I, listen, I, I know people, I've got relatives who think because somebody on CBS or NBC or ABC said it, it's the gospel truth. We don't even, and CNN, and MSNBC is a joke. Don't even watch them. You're talking about the most um, opinion, not even opinionated, most agenda-driven, perspective-driven, perspective agenda-driven people you've ever seen, that channel. Fox, no, people call Fox Noise. Let me tell you something. You want to know who the agenda-driven people are? Go. I, I, I read a newspaper report the other day. It was off a CBS substation. And it's amazing how they can write stuff and skew the entire concept of what they're trying to report on. But how they wrote it. And then you, you just kind of go, oh, we know what agenda they're trying to push. But just by what they said, how they wrote it. All right? But, you know, I mean, let's face it. There was a day that Walter Cronkite would say, and that's the way it is. September 24th, 19, I mean, 2013. And that was it. That's, Walter said it. In the TV. <laughs> no, Will of Fortune came on. Anyway. But, you know, when Walter said it, that was it. And then you had Tom, you had, I, and I, don't, I don't remember who. I'm trying to remember who the guy was on NBC way back then. And then you had, you know, the people over at ABC. You had, so you had your three main networks. And they said it. It was the gospel truth. There was, you didn't argue with it. They said it. And, let me, and I'm going to say something. There was a day, even if, they, even if they didn't like, if they had an agenda in their own personal life, when they got on television, they were, they were journalists with integrity, and they reported the news without the slant. That's no longer true. It's just not true anymore. It's, it's given with their slant, and, and, and they get away with it. But people think they're given, they're given unbiased reporting. Well, pfft. do you believe that? I got oceanfront property in Nebraska. Okay, I want to sell you some. Good price too, ten thousand an acre. Got about a million acres. I'll sell you. No, it's not true. Now, doctors do what doctors do, but they're not. They're not the. They're not the final result. Or a final report. In other words, you've got a choice to believe one report or the other. Now, the doctor says you got uh, this and you're going to die in six months. Or Jesus, 
the head of the church says, by my stripes you're healed. Now let me say something. Who you hook up with and, and run with and speak and speak in line with will greatly determine your outcome. Hello. Don't, well, God don't heal cancer. Well, now, Jesse had a classmate in high school, and um, he, he um, good kid. He's in the Army now. He's, um, he's working on his third master's. He was dumb in high school, by the way, at, at their high school. He was considered one of the dumb kids. Huh? He's going to get his doctorate next year. Three masters are working on his doctorate. See, you just don't, don't believe the stuff, what people say. Just because you're not the favorite child of the, of the school system or the teacher or the group or whatever doesn't mean you're not going to make it. Well, anyway, uh, about a year ago, I guess, his dad, December of last year, his dad was diagnosed with, with an aggressive cancer, given a time-limited time amount of time to live. Um, came in uh, beginning of the summer. They were they going to do some more, more chemo on him and so forth. He said, no, nah, I'm just going to take the next few months and just going to travel with my family, spend time with my family. And um, so came back in here um, at the end of the summer and went in and had all the tests run. They can't find a trace of it. Now, they're, they're believers. They're Christians. I don't know who, who was getting to them or giving them stuff. I know that her friend had gone on a missions trip overseas and saw demon-possessed people eyes glowing green and he you know they the people didn't believe that believe with that stuff he did after that <laughs> hello and him and him and jesse have had a lot of talks about deeper spiritual matters but you know what it's all gone so don't tell me cancer that it, it, you know when they say that's a death sentence and see now the doctor said i'm not supposed to say this but it's a miracle why aren't you supposed to say it What's wrong with saying it's a miracle? Because, you know, his colleagues will laugh at him. They don't believe in miracles. They believe, they believe in science. Well, I believe in miracles. I believe in Jesus. I believe there's, a greater, there's a one greater than the natural. All right? But see, you know, when you get a report, you're going to get reports. Everybody say, I'm going to get reports. But you have a choice when you get a report. Are you going to believe it or not? Amen. Are you going to believe it or not? Now, remember, I, you, know, you, could, you can go find it, but I'm just going to, you know, um, when Jesus healed the woman with the issue of blood, do you remember what he was on his way to do? Jairus had come and got him and said, Master, come to my house, lest my daughter die. Okay? And he, he was on his way with Jairus when the woman with the issue of blood interrupted that whole thing. Y'all remember that? And uh, you know, she came in, crawled through the crowd, touched him, his garment was healed. Jesus, knowing immediately in himself, virtue had gone out of him, turned about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And the disciples said, Master, thou seest the multitude throng of thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And he looking round about saw her. She came, fearing and trembling, fell down before him, told him all the truth. He said, Daughter, be a good cheer, thy faith has made thee whole. And right now, everybody's kind of clamoring over the fact that the woman with the issue of blood just got miraculously healed. Hello? People came from Jairus' house and said, Trouble the master no more, thy, little, thy, thy daughter is dead. Before he could say anything, Jesus said, be, he, said he said, be faith, he said, um, I, I'm, I'm going to mess this up. I was going to get my tongue. Hallelujah. How about that? Yeah, I went to Luke 5. Be not afraid. Actually, be not afraid, only believe. As soon as, the, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. What did he stop him from saying anything? Before he could open his mouth and begin to speak grief, began to speak, oh, my God, began to say anything full of unbelief. He stopped them and said, be, a, be not afraid, only believe. Had to shut him up. See, he, as, soon, when did you, as soon as he heard, he said, be not afraid, only believe. Then he goes to the house, and all the whalers are already out there. What do you mean the whalers? The, the paid mourners. Ah! 
ah! They, they wanted, how do you know they weren't in mourning? Because when he said, why are you, why are you uh, weeping? The little girl's not dead. She's only asleep. They started laughing at him. They couldn't, they couldn't have been. That's all they found in Mark 5. They, they, they couldn't have been in grief. I said they couldn't have been in grief. They wouldn't have started laughing so quick. Hello? Isn't that right? So Mark 5. Amen. He says, be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Why? you got to know. Listen, when you're dealing with life and death situations, you've got to know who you can have in the presence of everything and get the job done and who's going to be a deterrent and be an unbelief while you're standing there. That's why it's dumb to ask any and everybody to pray for you when something's going on. You better find people you know who know how to get in contact with God and know how to pray in faith. Well, that's, that's, I, I find that arrogant. If you don't know how to pray in faith, I don't want you praying. I don't want you going, oh, Lord, if it be your will, do this. But if not, comfort the family. That's just unbelief. Well, if God's going to do it, he's going to do it no matter what we say anyway. Is that right? Do you remember when Jesus went to a place and, and the Bible says he could there do no mighty work? Do y'all remember that? said he could there do no mighty work. Hello? Say he laid his hand on a few sick folk and healed them. Y'all here, y'all gone home. It's right over here in, in, in the next chapter. Look over in the next chapter, verse 1. And he came from that thence and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. And the Sabbath day was coming. He began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is given unto him? And even such mighty works are wrought by him. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, and of Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. And he could there do no mighty work. Now, the Bible does not say he wouldn't. Big difference between couldn't and wouldn't. Hello? Save. And the word save means accept. He laid his hand on a few sick folk and healed them. Now, now really, in the Greek, it says few sickly. Minor ailments. A couple of toothaches and a headache. The lame weren't walking. Lepers weren't being cleansed. Are you here? Dead weren't being raised. No, the Bible says he, well, they got offended at him. I don't believe in that laying on a hand stuff. You get offended. Hello? The head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the Bible says he could there do no body work. Didn't say he wouldn't. Didn't say God was trying to teach him a lesson. As a matter of fact, he gives us the reason for the next verse, verse 6. And he marveled because of their unbelief. He marveled because of their unbelief. Now, y'all here, you go home. He marveled because of what? Their unbelief. Hello? Their believing had something to do with him being able to work mighty works. Their unbelief had something to do with prohibiting him from working. Jesus. See, you get these people, these healing preachers, but they really had a gift they could do anything. They could heal anybody. I guess Jesus didn't have a gift. Hello? Come on now. He, he, the Bible tells us the reason that he could do no mighty work. He marveled because of their unbelief. And what does it say next? And he went about round about their villages teaching. Why? It was going to take the teaching what the Word said to undo the unbelief. The Word of God was the only thing to combat the unbelief. Amen. So you had this bunch of offended, know-it-all jerks. 
who Jesus couldn't get healed. Jesus couldn't work a mighty work. There's a lot of churches like that today. I don't believe in that healing business. You're just like that bunch there where he could there do no more. And you want, well, if we, you know, if we never see anybody healed in our church. I wonder why. You're all sitting around, you don't believe in it. Praying, Lord, if it be your will, heal our brother or sister. But if not, you know, I mean, uh, uh, help them put up with or learn the lesson you're trying to teach them. When did they find out? When they got to heaven? Now, Norval Hayes used to say about his church that he was in, I won't, I won't name the denomination he's in, but everybody that ever got on the chalkboard for the prayer, and the only people they put on the chalkboard were desperate cases. Everyone he ever saw that got put on that chalkboard for continual prayer, the only time they came off is when they died, and they all died. So he started praying, oh, God, don't ever let my name get on the chalkboard of the such and such church. I mean, just don't let it get up there. He knew why, because he knew them people would pray him right into death. They, they, you know, we've, we've, we've been praying for years for God to heal, but God's never healed anybody, so we just know it's not his will to heal, or, you know, he just has great, no, 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 unbelief. See, if you don't believe it's going to happen, you just don't need to talk, you just don't need to pray about it in the first place. Amen? I said, if you don't believe it's going to happen, there's no need to pray in the first place. I'll say it one more time. If you don't believe it's going to happen, therefore I say unto you, what things ever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. If you don't believe it, there's no need in praying it. And if it be thy will, let I me mean, go back and find out when that prayer was prayed in the Bible. Particularly, moving out of the Old Testament into the New. We have one record of an if it be thy will prayer. And it did not have anything to do with healing anybody. With prospering anybody. With delivering anybody. Of bringing anybody into the kingdom of God. What did it have to do? It had to do with Jesus committing himself to go to the cross. Where he said, if there's any other way for this to be done, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. It was in a prayer of consecration and dedication. Jesus never walked up, he didn't walk up to Lazarus' tomb and say, Father, if it be thy will, bring Lazarus forth. Is that what he said? As a matter of fact, what he said was this. Lord, Father, I know you hear me. You always hear my prayer. But I'm only praying this just so they'll know I'm talking to you. I'm paraphrasing a little bit here. Kind of bringing it down to you know, simple English. The only reason I'm praying this right now and before I do what I'm getting ready to do is so they'll know that it's you involved here. Okay, got that done? Lazarus, come forth. And he came out wrapped in grave clothes. He didn't say, if it be thy will. He said, I know you always hear me. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. Well, we got a glimpse of what the mindset of Jesus was over in 1 John. If we ask anything according to his will, we know he hears us. And if he hears us, we know we had the petition we desired of him. I'm paraphrasing again a little bit. Well, how do we know if we're asking according to his will? Bible will. Bible is God's will. You're not going to ascertain a different will of God that is out of harmony with the Word. Are you here? You're going home. See, we get people who, who are praying for God to give them a special revelation of His will when we already have His will. Now, let me say this. Remember, Jesus said in, in uh, John. The Gospel of John, I believe between 14 and 17, chapters 14 and 17. He said, I came not to do my will, but the will of him that sent me. Then remember, uh, Philip came to him one time and said, Master, show us the Father, uh, and it sufficeth us. 
And Jesus says, have you been with me so long you haven't figured this out? He that has seen me has seen the Father. Now, Jesus said he only did the will of the Father. Jesus told Philip that if you've seen me or seen me in action, you've seen the Father in action. I'm going to add a little bit to that, but that's really what he's saying. In other words, you, the things you've seen me do is what the... Remember, Jesus also said this. He said, the works I do, I don't do it myself. The Father in me, he doeth the works. Now, let me ask you something. How many people did Jesus make sick? I'm just asking. How many did he kill? How many wives did he kill of husbands so he, a husband could have an encounter with God in a deeper way? How many children did he walk by and curse them with some kind of disease and let them die so the parents could come to a deeper, uh, come into some deep walk with God. No. The Bible says the goodness of God leadeth a man to repentance. Amen? Are you here? You've gone home. I mean, I know people got all kinds of theological stuff. They, don't, they, don't, they, don't, they just don't know their Bible. They don't study it. They, they read surfacey stuff. They, read, they, they pull stuff out of context. They don't do a study. They just get that little surfacey thing, and it fits their little, their little elect or their little predestined doctrine or their little suffering doctrine, and they don't study it out enough to get some deep understanding of what the Scriptures are really saying and why it was being said. And they run out there and start purporting a bunch of gooby to God. God allowed, God, God could have stopped Shady Hook if he wanted to, but he didn't have some greater reason. No, he did not have a greater reason. Hello? He wasn't involved in that in any way, shape, or form. Hello? If we had people who heard from heaven, they would have known, they would have known what was going to happen ahead of time. We don't, people don't hear from heaven anymore because they're so carnal. Our churches are carnal. They don't, know, they, don't, they don't know how to hear the voice of the Spirit. They blame God for stuff. It, it makes them feel better to think that God did it in some kind of, you know, sovereignist thing where they can just kind of, well, you know, be, be absolved of all responsibility to pray and hear from heaven and he, get revelation about stuff and avoid things. <clears throat> now, Jairusville had a group of ministers, had a bunch of ministers over in Kenya. Remember the Kenyan bombings of 1990-something? Remember when those, those bombings took place? The embassies. One was in Kenya, one was somewhere else. I don't know if it was 99, 98, somewhere, you know, it's been, it's been a few years ago, about a couple, you know, about 15 years ago. But they had, they had people that, that were, had ministers and they had people that were in their churches. They were on their way to work to the embassy that morning. And something on the inside of them said, fall down on your face! And they did. Now you got to think. Would you, if you were walking downtown Greensboro and you heard on the inside of you, fall down on your face, you'd be going, what? And if you're doing that, you'd be going, what, boom? Because as soon as they hit the ground, the bomb went off and people beside them were blown away. But because they were on the ground, it went over top of them. And there was more than one of those testimonies. See, there are people in the New York Trade Center. Now, listen, I, I, listen, I'm not saying they're bad people, but if we don't know how to, if we're not teaching, I'm going to tell you, we are, if we're not teaching people how to hear the voice of God and how to respond to it and, and how to hear from heaven and how to follow after the Spirit, you know, our churches are to blame, not the people. Good people died in those buildings that shouldn't have been there that God spoke to them because we had testimonies of people that God spoke to and said, don't go to work this morning. And they just called in and said, I'm not coming in today. Didn't call in and said, I'm not coming in today. They would have been killed. I believe the Holy Ghost told everybody, was trying to tell every single person that went to work that morning not to go. But they didn't hear. They're not the bad people. It doesn't make them bad people. I think the churches need to get busy teaching the things of God instead of a bunch of goobity God. I've been try, trying to be agenda-driven and, and make sure that all the homosexuals and lesbians feel comfortable. They shouldn't feel comfortable. They should not feel comfortable. They should feel convicted for being in violation of the laws of God so that they can repent and get straightened out. Not, you're, a, you're a hate monger. You're a homophobe. I'm not afraid of homosexuals. I don't hate them. Just because I tell you the truth doesn't mean I hate you. As a matter of fact, the Bible says speak the truth of love. I love you. I'm for you. I want the best. I want you, I want you delivered. But see, the, 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 the way the devil always does stuff, you're, 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 how many remember abortion? Do you know if until they came up with the term pro-choice, the, the majority of Americans were against abortion? 
But when they came up with pro-choice and man trying to control a woman's reproductive rights as their mantra, all that changed. You got women, you keep your hands off my body. Okay. If enough men kept their hands off your body, you wouldn't have to get an abortion. Hello? That went over big. If they all just kept their hands off the body, you wouldn't have to deal with that. It has nothing to do with a man keeping his hands off your body. It has to do with killing the unborn. Hello? But because they changed the, the terminology surrounding it, everybody changed. See? Everybody wants to, you know, and so they're trying to stop the church from dealing with homosexuality and, all, and lesbianism and LBGT and all that kind of stuff by calling you hate mongers. The minute you say I'm against it, you're a hate monger. No, I'm not. You've got a devil and you need it cast out of you. You need to be delivered. Hello? You, God wants you in heaven. Jesus died for you to deliver you. Amen. That went over big. But the church doesn't teach people how to hear the voice of God, how to act on the voice of God. I know we started out on faith, but this is all, it's intertwined. Thank you. Now, let's go, let's, we'll circle back. Now, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So then I, I, it always begs me to question things. People, people ought to at least think reasonable. If Jesus said, the works that I do, the Father in me, he doeth the works. I do not my will, but the will of him that sent me. Then it seems to me you wouldn't have to ask God what his will was. You would just need to go look at what Jesus did. That seems, and I challenge you, don't take my word for it. If Jesus said that I, you know, that he has seen me, he's seen the Father, that I, I cannot do my will but the will of him that sent me, then I, a, reason, a reasonable deduction from that would be that you can go study the ministry of Jesus and that would give you a very uh, clear, concise overview of the will of the Father. Seems reasonable to me. Isn't it amazing that not one time do we have recorded in the ministry of Jesus that he made somebody sick. Isn't it amazing? Why? Because we have people teaching in the church that God makes people sick to teach them something. That when, some, it, it, that when somebody came to him that was sick, not one time did he say to them, my father is teaching you something so I'm going to lay hands on you and give you the grace to bear up under this disease so that you can learn your lesson. Not one time. Hello? Well, he told, he told the, uh, the woman who begged behind him whose daughter was grievously vexed the devils that it wasn't meet to take the, the children's bread and give it to the dogs. He's talking covenant talk there. People outside the covenant didn't have a covenant right to it. But how did she get it? Faith. She said, yeah, Lord, but even the dogs get the crumbs. All I need is a crumb. He said, go your way, woman. Faith, your faith has made you, has, 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 even as you believe, be it unto you. And a door was set free that very hour, the Bible says. We just, the things we teach in the church today in relation to what God does to people, we cannot find in the ministry of Jesus. I'm talking about the making them sick, causing calamity to take place. I mean, did you know that when Jesus got up in the boat, he didn't say, make the storm bigger! Need a Cat 5 Red Sea storm tonight! Is that what he said? No, he said, peace be still. Hello? Wait a second. Do you remember when the disciples came to him and they were upset because, because um, the city had rejected their preaching? And they wanted, remember, James and John, the sons of thunder, sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, wanted to call fire and brimstone down on them. They wanted to cook them, baby. And what did he say? Yep, that's what my father said. We're going to cook them tonight. We're going to take them out. What did he say? You know not what spirit you're of. 
Now, just because they rejected the message at that moment, did not mean, God was going to give them a chance to get right. Hello. But we run around, and if, and if, a, bad, if a flood, and people get killed, whatever, oh, God had some mysterious reason. Yeah, little g God. God of this world, God. And whom the God of this world, Satan, not God. The Word of God calls Satan the God of this world. And all those insurance policies would be right. They would just change it from a capital G to a little g, lowercase g. Put the parentheses beside it, Beelzebub. How would you like to be known as the, the Lord of the maggots? The maggot God? He's Lord of the flies. Beelzebub means Lord of the flies. That's, they come from maggots. He's a maggot God. That's just wonderful, isn't it? I know we've diverse, but, you know, it's all, it's, you know, really it all has to do, it's all intertwined because if you understand, you can't believe God's going to do something if you don't know it's his will to do it. You might hope. You might wish. You might would like for it to be that way. Hello? But I don't make it that way. You got to know what the Bible says. And so, so I'll, I'll just present it one more time to you for, for consideration, especially those watching uh, via the web and so forth. If you can't find Jesus doing it, why in the world do you think God's doing it now? Well, he, he changed. Oh, really? Then you better go cut Hebrews 13, 8 out of your Bible. Because it says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. I kind of mess up your, he changed his mantra style, his style of ministry. See, we've got, we've got to be, look at the Word of God closer. And stuff people say just doesn't make sense a lot of times. It just doesn't make sense. Hello? I, I always try to tell people, especially when we get into election and, you know, predestination. Election and predestination without foreknowledge isn't accurate. For whom he foreknew, he did predestine, be conformed to the image of his son. Didn't say he, or he, whom he, did not say he did predestine people to be conformed to the image of his son. It said, for whom he foreknew, he did predestine. What does it mean? He knew who would accept Jesus and who wouldn't. But the Bible, well, that's because he made it that way. No, he said, the Bible says he's not willing that any should perish. His will is that none perish, but people do. And the ones he foreknew that wouldn't uh, perish, but that would come accept Jesus, he predestined to be conformed to his image. So you've got to have the, fore, without the foreknowledge, you can't, you can't make, so a lot of scriptures on election become applicable under the, under the banner of, pre-knowledge or foreknowledge. Yeah, I'm elect, but it's according to his foreknowledge. He knew I would. Because he was willing that whoever didn't get elected, for them to get saved, but they rejected. He didn't make them reject. They rejected their own. He didn't make you born a prostitute or whatever so he could show his grace. To you. I'm telling you, people say some of the stupidest stuff. I'm going to do a teaching on that whole thing where Paul talked about um, you know, the potter and the clay. I, I, I got, got a hold of some really good stuff on that. It, it, it goes back to understanding why it was being said, how it was being said, the context being said, who it was being said to. You, you, we need to be better, better Bible students. You need to be better Bible students. You need to be a Berean. The Bible says they received the Word of God with all readiness of mind, but search the Scriptures daily to see whether those things be so or not. In other words, yeah, it was great, sounded good, but they went and proved it out with the Word. They didn't accept it until they could prove it out in the Bible, in the Scriptures that they did have. And you remember, most, most preaching was done from the Old Testament at that time. They were, they were unveiling the Old Testament. And that's where the writings of Paul and Peter, James, and John, and, 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 and uh, uh, all that began to take place. And it became New Testament Scripture, but they were unveiling the Old Covenant. Amen? Praise the Lord. All right. 
Is that good enough for tonight?